Good morning, and welcome to Comics for Breakfast. I'm your host, Jason Mink. When it comes to super teams, comic publishers have no shortage of options for the potential customer. Do you like DC Comics? Well, try the Justice League. Too white bread for you? Well, consider Justice League Dark, made up of edgy, supernatural characters. Don't like weird stuff? Well, then try Justice League 3000, featuring futrified versions of the standard six flavors. Or how about Young Justice, featuring teenage heroes? Or Pound of Justice, featuring overweight animal takes on your favorite archetypes? Okay, actually, maybe I imagined that last one in a three-bean burrito-induced fever dream, but the point still stands. Comic publishers know that teams sell, and if you sell comics... Well, I don't need to draw you a map. Putting all your mans on one team is a great way to maximize profit, and Marvel Comics was well aware of this. They had loads of teams by the late 1960s. It was the odd hero who didn't have some group association, but this wasn't for lack of trying. In spite of starting off with the Avengers, the Hulk here didn't really fit in with that book and had become, while a popular guest star, unlikely to be recruited to another supergroup anytime soon. And then there was the sky-born rider of the spaceways, the Silver Surfer, introduced in Fantastic Four number 48. And while the character's massive popularity with readers uh, was undoubtable, it didn't translate into a successful solo book, leaving him essentially stranded in supporting roles. And then there's Prince Namor, a.k.a. the Submariner. Created by Bill Everett in 1942, Namor had already had a rich and varied publishing history by the time the early 1970s rolled around. He'd even briefly served on a super team during the Second World War, setting a precedent that Marvel was eager to follow. So, how could the publisher create a new title with such disparate elements? The answer was, of course, a non-team. When the Doctor Strange title was cancelled in 1970, writer Roy Thomas was forced to finish his tale in other books that he was currently scripting. Readers of Submariner No. 22 and The Incredible Hulk No. 126 capped up the best they could as Thomas wrapped his tale of Lovecraftian yog so tothery bringing Marvel-era heroes into his pulp-flavored potboiler. It felt like a strong maybe, but Marvel clearly wanted to refine the formula before going toe-to-toe with Coke. Marvel feature number three appeared in June of 1972, featuring a modified lineup of Submariner Hulk and the recently orphaned Doctor Strange, who was just happy for the work. Whence the Silver Surfer? Well, it's said that, in spite of his solo title's failure, publisher Stan Lee felt that the surfer's potential was too great to tie up in a monthly team book. Unlike The Fantastic Four, a tightly knit family-based book, or The Avengers grouping Marvel's elite, the Defenders would be a non-team, played fast and loose. In the beginning, there was no headquarters, no means of communication other than Strange reaching into your brain and telling you just where to show up. Issue 4 of The Defenders saw a new creative team on the book. Writer Steve Engelhart and artist Sal Buscema brought fresh energy and concepts to The Defenders with some familiar faces along the way. Readers were reintroduced to the Valkyrie and the squadron sinister castaway Nighthawk, as well as seeing slumming Avenger Hawkeye come and go in a blink and you'll miss him appearance. Today we're focusing on a three-parter that I found especially striking and not just because it features the Wrecking Crew. 
I was taken in by the stakes. This isn't some universe-threatening conflict by any means, but a ground-level battle where circumstances and interpersonal dynamics make for a gripping read. Grab your copies of Defenders number 17 through 19 and read along. Or just watch the screen. I'll show you the pictures. Giddy up! Our story begins with Nighthawk attempting to ride Pegasus with predictable results. Good thing he can fly, huh? The freshly bucked hero joins his compatriots heading into a nearby ranch house. It's there recent recruit Valkyrie reveals she must leave the group to go in search of clues to her mysterious past. She changes her outfit, but somehow she's even more noticeable now than when she's wearing salt shakers for a bra. We're told it's because of her sword, but come on, man. Later, Val says her goodbyes, with Nighthawk coming on a little too strong. Learn to read the room, bud. Her departure is hard on the team, especially on the Hulk, who's quickly grown attached. Unwilling to be placated by his teammates, the Jade Giant has a fit and storms off, with Strange and Nighthawk just letting him leave. Seems pretty hands-off, considering the Hulk's propensity for destruction. you think they'd at least send Wong along to keep tabs on things. Inside, Nighthawk gripes about how the group has essentially fallen apart. Seems building them a secret clubhouse was a touch premature. Just then, a call comes in for Nighthawk's daytime persona, Kyle Richmond. It's his accountant, and there's trouble a-brewing. Seems criminal quartet The Wrecking Crew is threatening to demolish one of Richmond's buildings unless a ransom of ten million dollars is met. Strange and Richmond watch in real time as the building is demolished on live TV before the wrecking crew issue their ultimatum. They're to be given $25 million by sunset tomorrow or they'll bring down all of New York City. Richmond is informed two of his properties have been destroyed so far with the third now in danger. This is enough to scramble the remaining defenders back to Manhattan, where they approach the Richmond building still under construction. From the shadows, a powerful pair of hands grabs our heroes, pulling them back into the darkness. They are slammed into a nearby wall, but are not so stunned that they miss the unexpected reveal of... Luke Cage? What the heck is he doing here? Turns out Cage was hired to protect Richmond's property, and he's not about to share the task with a jive-talking turkey and his winged pal. Doc fires a bolt of mystic energy to dissuade the hero for hire, but inadvertently damages a weight-bearing pillar, justifying Cage's suspicions about the pair. And with that, the scrap is on, Cage laying into Strange with a haymaker. Nighthawk answers in kind, providing artist Sal Busima the chance to draw one of his favorite panels. The two men battle on, with Cage keeping Nighthawk on the defense. In spite of being overmatched, the defender manages to stay on his feet, even after having a ceiling dropped on him. However, before things can get nasty, Strange intercedes. Fighting amongst themselves is pointless when the true villain remains at large. And, as if in answer, a massive impact causes the metal framework of the building to collapse, sending the trio plunging downwards in a rain of debris. It's only the quick thinking of the Doc that saves them, but he may have simply prolonged their inevitable doom, as the smoke clears to reveal the Wrecking Crew. Ah, the Wrecking Crew. There's just something so refreshing about those guys, especially with the hindsight of time. There's no heavy backstory or bullcrap motivation. They're just four pissed-off jerks with axes to grind, however unjustified. In place of some moral absolute, they're human to a fault, a flaw which inevitably proves to be their undoing. Ah, but I'm getting ahead of myself. In the rubble of a recently toppled building, the Defenders and Luke Cage face off against the Wrecking Crew. Before the two sides can come to blows, the sound of approaching police sirens pierces the night air. At Team Leader Wrecker's prompting, Thunderball throws his weapon at the oncoming cars. 
Strange attempts to intervene with a spell, but the wrecking ball appears to move with a will of its own, darting around the spell's effect and smashing into the lead vehicle. The other cops keep coming, Wrecker directing Piledriver to ram the cars. Once again, Strange attempts to cast a spell to stop the carnage, but before he can complete it, the defenders are taken out by a nearby water main. Pile driver and bulldozer knock the cop cars out of commission with ease, with one of the men letting slip a crucial clue to their true intent. They're looking for a gizmo, but will come back later for it after the heat's off. Well, that's the plan anyway. They encounter a mystic barrier erected by Strange to keep them from escaping, a fact that drives the crew into a desperate frenzy. They move savagely to attack their foes, but... Hey, remember Valkyrie? She left the team last issue to discover the key to her mysterious past or some such. She's arrived in a small town where we're treated this little flashback for those who came in late. Cultist Barbara worships the Lovecraftian horror known as the Nameless One. In the process of sacrificing the Hulk, Barbie's drawn into the Nameless One's shadowed realm, where she mates with the malefic entity and goes mad. What happened to a nice simple origin like exposure to cosmic rays, huh? Back in New York, the two sides continue to brawl. Cage and his foe play a little three-sewer stickball, the former using a torn girder as a baseball bat. It's this sort of hyper-exaggerated action that made comics of this era so engaging. Yes, the heroes are fighting for significant stakes, but writer Len Wein is still capable of having some fun with the premise. And hey, dig that Salbusima saliva. I was going to say that knocked out pose was his trademark, but honestly, when I think of Sal, I think splayed fingers and ropey spit. Bulldozer attempts to even the score, but Nighthawk has commandeered a crane. Want to guess who's tougher? Nighthawk is wise enough to fly the coop, getting an assist from a now pissed off Doctor Strange. Pile Driver shakes up the docks so the wrecker can give him a swat. And man, Strange should be in traction about six times over by now. Good thing he does all that hot yoga. In the end, all the wrecking crew want to do is leave, but the defenders aren't having it. What we have here is a failure to communicate. Some men you just can't reach. So we have a little standoff, and since there are still some pages to fill, how about a nice little flashback to pad things out? After helping the Wrecker escape prison and retrieve his enchanted weapon, a fortuitous lightning strike divides the power in the wrecking bar between the four men. And hey, there's that ropey spit again. Someone get this guy a bottle of scope. Illuminated by his foe's helpful origin, Strange deigns to have the crew's power for himself, stripping it away with the aid of a mystic spell. Before he can finish, the unexpected occurs. Doc topples, his will battered by the Incredible Hulk's assault on the magic barrier. Hulk just wants to help his pals, not understanding that if Strange drops the wall, the villains may escape. And while the Doc does his best, Old Greenskin is determined to get in, and Strange passes out, the spell lapsing. The barrier down and their powers restored, the Wrecking Clue rally, but the Hulk is there to even the odds. He lays out Bulldozer with a single blow, but his overconfidence leads to Wrecker getting the drop on him. It'll take more than an enchanted Wrecking Bar to stop the Hulk, however. He knocks the Wrecker into range of Nighthawk, who seems like a much easier target. The winged hero evades the Wrecker's powerful blows, giving him a kick to the head for his trouble. It's then the villains remember that the wall keeping them there is down, and they make a run for it, planning on returning for the gizmo later. But a stroke of luck sees Thunderball coming across the mysterious device in the debris, but upon opening it, we discover the horrifying truth. The Gamma Bomb. It's gone. So begins issue 19, and that's bad news. A Gamma Bomb is the last thing you want to lose. Doc Strange demands answers, and Thunderball is happy to comply, believing his fate to be sealed. Turns out he was a big brain back in the day, a Black Bruce Banner. His words, not mine. After miniaturizing a gamma bomb, he brings the fruit of his efforts to his employers, who steal the device and his research. 
Thundy moves to steal it back, an act that sees him inadvertently lose his bomb in the materials being used for the construction of the Richmond buildings. Turns out this whole ransom thing just covered for the destruction of the buildings until the bomb could be found. Strange attempts to come up with a plan of action for the missing weapon, but the wrecking crew are primed for violence and attack once again. With the element of surprise on their side, they do all right in the short term, getting the drop on the unsuspecting defenders. When our heroes wake up, they aren't alone, their foes having fled the scene. A pair of cops attempt to arrest them, which goes about as well as you'd expect. The law incapacitated the defenders move on, encountering a panhandler who ends up on the receiving end of this nice Thanksgiving layout. Topical. Making their way through the neighborhood on foot, the group is approached by a young boy who pleads with them for help against the four guys tearing up his clubhouse. Seems the wrecking crew have traced the bomb to this group of kids, who it turns out are not easily intimidated. This young fellow sneaks off with the aforementioned bomb, which the defenders don't immediately confiscate for safekeeping. You know, I can't help but feel the Avengers would have wrapped this all up while introducing a subplot or two by now. Anywho, the Hulk heads into the clubhouse first, allowing us this chuckle-worthy sequence. Choom, indeed. Now angry, Hulk and his fellows smash through the wall, bringing the fight home. Obviously tired of being mopped up by these second-rate clowns, the defenders get the stick out and start kicking ass. Turns out all the fighting could set off the bomb. Spurred by strange warning, the two groups take it outside. And did you know Thunderball can bank his weapon like Captain America's shield? Because the Hulk sure didn't. That said, it'll take more than that to take down old Greenskin. He catches the wrecker's wrecking ball in one hand and crushes it before sending its owner sailing off into the stratosphere. Cut to an outclass Nighthawk about to get pulverized by Bulldozer. Some quick thinking sees the defender outwit his foe in a delightfully brutal manner. And hey, remember how Luke Cage was here? I think the writer must have forgotten, but he's back now, throwing hands with Piledriver until taking out his head condemned foe. It's all down to Doctor Strange versus the Wrecker, the mage electrifying his foe's weapon until the discharge drives him away. With that, the Doc sends the Mystic Bar off into the void. Another questionable move from a guy you'd expect to know better. But, hey, there's a bomb we need to dismantle. It seems like the only one smart enough to do that is a scientist, and where to find one of those at this hour? Well... The Hulk is a scientist, sometimes. Maybe that's worth a shot. Doc talks him down from his Hulkified state, and the Jade Giant reverts to Bruce Banner with just enough time to disable the atomic device. But can he do it without hulking back out? Banner just manages to deactivate the bomb before reverting back to his bestial state, leading to a bittersweet ending with Cage stalking off with a head full of steam over his perceived loss. Hey, come back. We need help cleaning all this up. The Defenders was Marvel's black sheep by design, but in spite of its unusual pedigree, it was successful enough to be published well into the 1980s. And while team members would come and go over the years, it would be the core lineup that readers would remember, a fact that Marvel wouldn't be sure to miss. It's pretty much a given that whenever the Defenders show up, the group is some variation of that classic non-team. And we wouldn't have it any other way. Thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider sharing it with your friends, your family, or your enemies. Yes. Share it with your enemies. I'm Jason Mink, and I hope to see you next Sunday. At breakfast.